Today in the studio, folks, I've got a real motherfucking treat for you. Mauro Stendel. That's me. Now, this dude from the Israeli Special Forces. That's true. All the way from Man. Argentina. Correct. Like, dude, your story's crazy because, like, you're from Argentina, but you're Jewish, so you went to the Israeli Army, Special Forces. You wrote a book, multiple business owner. What, what's your main business? I do e-commerce. I do real estate. And um, right now, what I'm doing is the new projects, which call called Quantic Ventures. I'm buying small businesses to increase their value. Yeah, but mainly, uh, you wrote a book here recently, which is which is what I want to discuss. It's Correct. The fa it's the three phases towards, towards instant, instant success. success. Correct. Instant. In, well, not instant, but... Yeah, it's part of your... You got to change the title once, now. No, because once you're applying it... You just said it, not instant. It is instant, actually. Okay, good. Because you're already successful in the process. <laughs> good recovery. Right. But what why, What are the three phases? Okay, so the three phases are... It starts first from my childhood, right? When I wanted to move to Israel to serve in a special unit, I literally left everything. My mom was sick, and the first thing I was scared is to not see her again. So what I did, How I, old were you? I was 17 and she had Parkinson's and kidney disease, the kidney failure. And, um, she was really sick at that time. And I had this dream to go to a special unit in Israel. What gave you that dream? Well, everything started when I was 15, I was boxing and I felt I was quite good at it. And I wanted to do something for my community. So I started volunteering for the Jewish community in Argentina for special events or go to the synagogue because there is a lot of anti-Semitism there. We had some terror attacks. In 82, the Israel embassy exploded. In 94, an Israeli uh, Jewish building exploded. So, you know, pretty much our community wants to protect ourselves, so I volunteered there. And while I was there, I started learning about Israel, why it should be special for me if I'm a Jewish. And I learned about this law of return. See, I don't know if everybody knows about the law of return. That's a good law. Yeah, so tell everybody. So the law of if return, you happen to be Jewish and you're listening to this, if you, you, you may or may not know this. But you, you need to prove it. If you can prove you're Jewish. How do you prove? What if you just claim? Well, you have to show um, when Jewish people get married, there is like a special paper signed from a rabbi that claims that this is yeah, a but Jewish what if I, marriage. What if I want to become Jewish right now? Well, then it will cost you like a year. Oh, you have to go do stuff? You have to like learn a lot. Ah. Uh, yeah, a lot. I see. I mean, it's going to be hard. And we have this policy, let's call it, in our religion, that when somebody wants to convert, we don't like, oh, okay, welcome. We have to make it hard. Like, no, this is not for you, you know? Like, to show that you really want it. Yeah. It's the opposite of others. Um, so this law says that if you can prove you're Jewish, they'll give you um, straight citizenship when you move there. They'll give you six months of salary until you learn the language. Who's salary? Salary? It, well, it's not really a salary. It's like a basket. Let's They call it basket. So they'll give you money so you can... Enough money to live. Enough money to live while you have free Hebrew lessons for six months. And they'll get you a place to sleep and food. And then after that, they'll help you get a job or free university. Or you can go to the army if you have the age. And my dream was to be in a special unit. I got into the security volunteering and I start. I, I, I loved it when I was a kid. I saw these movies about spies and I wanted to be like them. Just like a kid sees a guitar guitarist and wants to be like them. I was like that. And uh, I also thought if I want to be a lawyer and that, let's say a Harvard uh, degree is the best, if you want to be in security, having a special unit in Israel diploma will be badass, right? I'll get any job in security international that I want. And that's what I wanted to do besides, you know, helping Was Israel. Was that another dream? You were a dreamer, weren't you? I'm a dreamer. <laughs> Always look high. So I spoke to my mom and I told her, listen, I have this dream. I really want to go, but I'm scared to not see you again. And she told me this, I will never forget. I'm going to die anyways. I will love you to stay with me. If you stay with me, I can enjoy my last years with my kid. But when I die, you have no mom and no dream. So you better go and make sure you achieve your dream. So when I die, you at least, you know, fulfill that dream. Mm. So that was the we'll first. We'll give her a bomb. We'll give her a mom. A, mo a, a bomb. <laughs> we'll uh, give her a mom. A bomb. That's a good bomb. That's yeah. a good mom too. Yeah, good because most of, good mom. most of the mothers, she was the opposite, will tell you like, no, don't go there. I'm scared. I want, because they love you. People that love you will try to keep you 
low, you know? Yeah. Just from love. They and don't not, want you to risk it. Yeah, and I'm not going to rush the story for all the people that are wanting to hear little bit by little bit. But you eventually came over here to the United States with 500 bucks in your pocket, slept in a car, basically bummed it around. You applied these three phases yes. again here. And it worked. And now you're rich. Yeah, pretty much. So that's where we're going, folks. So stay tuned. We're going to break for these special messages. No, I'm just joking. Keep going. Perfect. <laughs> that's like if I have so advertisers. When I left, when I in order to be in a spe the special unit I wanted to be, there is, look, there is, the the military there is, is mandatory. So imagine the amount of 18 year old kids that go to the army in a yep. year. All so, of them. All of them, yeah. So to this unit, you have hundreds of thousand people that want to apply and get in. How a person doesn't speak Hebrew can get in. It's impossible, right? Not for me. So I created this plan, which I didn't, I didn't know it was these three phases. I, then when I, got in the army, I started learning about execution and I said, okay, this is exactly what I did. So the first thing is creating a point of no return. Burn your no boats. way back. Yes. That's exactly what I did. Once you move to Israel and once they give you citizenship and you're in age, the army is mandatory. So now you have to go. There is no way back. And if I will escape, I'll be um, like um, deserting. Yeah. You, and you cannot never come back to Israel. And for as, as a Jewish, that's a really big punishment. So that's, that I created a point of no way back. There's no way back. So is that phase number one? Yes. Burn but we're going to learn it really deeply in the army when we started doing on the cover Yeah, but missions. I got to be clear. Right. The, the first that's the step first one, one is burn no, your boats. Yeah, point of no way back. Yes. Now see, now see again, like, dude, I normally will advise against that. Okay. Do you know why? Why? Because a lot of people are so afraid to jump because they know they're going to have to burn all their boats that they never jump. So some people need to burn their boats in order to jump. And then some people, they don't jump if they burn their boats. So you tell them, make your boats nice and comfortable, which is the one I was. Because like when I quit my job, I, I, I knew I could come back and get this job anytime I want. So right. why was I so afraid of quitting it? I could, it's there when I want it, if I want it. So I could jump knowing the boat was sitting there comfy, ready to be deployed. Should I need it? What do you say about that? Well, I think that you will never fight as strong as you could if you knew that you have no way back. Well, that's true. That's and true. And you may give up easier. Yeah, but you use the word fight. Building a business isn't always necessarily fighting. But I get your point. And I mean, it's fighting. You're, you know, all whatever scares you and whatever you think it's impossible. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I would say when it comes to fighting, burn your boats. Why? Because, dude, you're right. You're never going to fight harder because you got no other way. Right. But when it comes to business, there's two ways you can go, in my opinion. Okay. And I tell people sometimes, don't burn your boats because then you'll be too scared to jump. But you first jump and then you burn your boats. Well, what if you don't burn your boats? Then you will... You just because you have an option to retreat doesn't mean you will. Well, but it's something that it's from like thousands of years. It's even written in the Torah, you know, the Jewish book. Sure. That if you surround the King Solomon said this, if you surround an army from west, east, north, and south, it's a it's a mistake because they will fight extremely hard against you. If you leave them one way to escape, they won't fight as much as they could because they know, okay, like let's just survive. We're going to escape from the East. Yeah. All right. Well, anyway, this is what worked for you. So it's not, it's unimportant. I don't know if I'm convinced, but, okay. but that's the only way. However, it is a way. It is. It is a way that. So that's phase worked one for me and work for a lot of people. I know a lot of people that subscribe to you. I get arguments about this all the time. Okay. But, but continue. Okay. So that's the first step that I did. But I didn't study that. I just did that. You know, I, I didn't. I was 17 years old. I, yeah, you I, said screw it. And, yeah, and, and I'm just left yourself I'm, I'm no other kid. option. And then my problem. Look, in order to get to a special forces in Israel, it's not really much about how strong you are, or how fast you are. The mentality there is, I think it's quite different from here. Let's say you want to be in a special unit in Israel, and I want to go there as well, and so we are competing. Let's call it like that, right? If we run for two hours and I did in those two hours, I did 
eight kilometers and I passed out. And is in these those two hours you did fifteen kilometers and you arrive as a champion, just drink some water and you go to go for another round. Who do you think they're gonna pick? Well, you would assume the winner. Right. But it's not correct. But they picked the dude that passed yes, out. Yes, because the the guy that passed out gave everything. That means the guy that ran for fifteen kilometers could give sixteen and pass out. So if you train the person that has the mentality to give everything, he's going to be a badass. He's going to be a, the best soldier in the world. So I knew I could give everything because I already gave up on everything. So now the problem was the Hebrew because I didn't know how to speak. So a lot of immigrants that go to Israel, I, I think maybe here too, they fall in this mistake of keeping in the bubble, stay in the bubble. You know, you don't trust all other people, so just keep with the people you know. They speak your language. Be live in those neighborhoods. Be like them, and you'll be fine, right? But then, when you want to be in a special unit, you really have to speak as exactly as they speak. You have to behave like them. You have to do everything as they do. So, what I did is that it, I just left the immigration community. Let's call it like that, and I blend in the society with Israelis. Listen to their music. Eat their food. Literally have an Israeli routine, let's call it like that. Go to their parties, everything. And I started speaking so fast. In five, six months, I was already speaking ex like really fluent, read and write. And then the problem is that uh, you have to go to the army after they teach you Hebrew, right? And the government will subside one course. If you want to go to a special unit and you want to take an extra course, that's on you. But how am I going to pay for that? I don't have money. So... I found this family uh, that they gave me a room because they have a spare room. They let me sleep there. They were uh, Jews from Yemen. You know, this country in Africa called Yemen and so, uh, the Jewish people left, left in the 56 to Israel, most of them. And there was a Yemenite, Yemenite family living in Israel and I'm sleeping in the room. They gave me because they had a spare room and they, they liked that I went to the army there without my family. So they wanted to help me out. Mm -hmm. So I was waking up at 5 a.m. going to Hebrew lessons come back, did, do my homework, work out, go to, uh, I was working as a waitress in weddings, so I could get some nice tips. And um, I was, it was five months of really hard work to get my Hebrew enough to go to special units. And when I went to the first interview, my, my Hebrew was enough, I did it. I had $80 in my bank account, 80 shekels, which would be like, I don't know, $20. But I got Hebrew in one year, enough to go to the special unit you know they test you like they go they speak to you and they also make you like grammar test and i did it exactly as an israeli will do it so then with 20 dollars in my bank account i understood i could i could do everything i want in my life everything so in the in when i went to the tryouts you know there's literally hundreds of thousands of people i want to get to this unit so first there's a first day that they just you know, make you run until you puke. Some people give up. They just want a filter who's who really doesn't really want it that bad. So it's a good thing if you puke. If you puke and continue, it's good. If you puke and give up, then yes, it's good to puke. Keep going. <laughs> so then the second test is five days. And those five days were probably the hardest days in my life. Because they really, it's only 500 people that qualify to that over hundreds of thousands of kids. And they will choose 25. So those five days are extremely, extremely hard. And they test you, not only physically, they make you run all day, all night, but they, they, they want to see how secure you are. For example, there is an interview there. It is a, a good story. When I get in the room, I sit down and he looks at me and says, close the door. But I knew, I knew I was, I was going to have these kind of interviews. I prepare so good, which this is the third step, which is variables. You have to learn the variables once you're in the stage that you want to be. How are you going to act? What are you going to say? If they tell you this, what are you going to do? So for the interviews, I was so ready. I look at his eye. I said, I closed the door already. I didn't look back. And then he said, okay, let's continue. I knew it was a trick because I was preparing for this. I learned, in, literally, I, I was asking so many people that went to these interviews, like, how was it? What did they tell you? I, I had so many variables that what they could ask me, what not, that I knew it by heart. I said, no, it's already closed. And they, we continue. And then, you know, they test your security. What's your story? What's your motivation? What would you do if you don't get to a special unit? And then he says, well, Mauro, you, 
you know, you, everything looks good. I just have one last question. How many steps you climbed when you came to this room? What would you do? 14. Well, then they check and it's not 14. It you have, was, you have to answer I counted quick. when I came up the room. Well, what I did, I told him the same amount of stairs I have in my house. And then he said, how many? I said, you said one last question. And I offered my hand. He shook my hand and I got in. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's a good one. That's damn good. Anyways, when I get into this unit, um, we start where learning. You, where do you get your stories, dude? You got killer stories. Well, I prepare for this. Yeah. I prepare. I, well, I, I sit say, down. When you were saying the third one, variables, variables. That, that is preparation. Yes. So like chess, my father was a chess enthusiast. And also I like, for example, uh, coding. There, you have so many variables. But if you study all of them, you, you, there's no room for mistake. The system, what does a software takes time to do? Because they have to do all the variables. If the client puts this, but if the client puts that, but if you have all of them, there's no room for mistake. That's exactly how I got into so this podcast. So they're looking for wittiness. So they're looking, they're, I mean, they don't look for you to learn these variables. I, was, I just wanted not to take the chance. I said, I'm going to be there and I'll be there. And there, if I learn all the variables, there, there, I will never be in shock or failing because I know how to behave if they tell me this or if they tell me that. In chess, when you play the pawn here, but the, he plays the, the horse here and okay, the best move is this one. But then if he moves this one, I move this one. That's preparing the, all the variables. Now, when I get into this unit, we start learning how to, you know, uh, the do the venue that does undercover uh, missions and... The point of this is when you when you try to get um let's call it VIP person that it's planning a terror attack and he has bodyguards and and it's really hard to get you cannot go dress as a soldier hey can you just get out please like we need you to answer some questions and go to jail they have people so the idea is to blend in right but the point of studying how to do a special mission I believe every special forces have this in the map when you're going to the mission There is a way, there's a point that they create, this is a point of no way back. And when you cross it in the car, helicopter, walking, however you're going to your mission, they'll tell you, no way back. You have no ammo, you have to go to the bathroom, you miss your mom, there's no way back. You look, you're 19 year old, you look at your friend and you know, you're either successful or you die. And that's a strong feeling when you're 19 year old. So... That's the first thing you have to do to be successful in a special mission that it's even secret. There is a point of no way back. And that's extremely important. That's the burn your boat thing again. That's correct. Well, see, I, you're starting to see you these disagree. phases appear again. Well, th but that now it's in the army, right? Yeah, well, in that context, I would agree. Correct. In that context, it okay, so the, now we have an agreement. That's okay. Now, the second one was um, to blend in. You have to imitate exactly as I did with the Israelis. I went to their parties, I, I listened to their music, I, I speak how they spoke. In order to get to these people, you have to blend in a society. There's no way you can get these people if you just come as a soldier and, hey, can you please get out, as I tell you. So blending in, it's extremely important to be successful in what's, whatever is your goal. You want to be a golf player? Well, go to the golf course, but if you dress like a clown, nobody will speak to you, Right? But if you go dress as they dress, speak like they speak. And I'm not saying fake it until you make it. Because when you're faking it until you're making it, whoever has made it already will recognize you with three questions. Three simple questions, they know you're faking. What are, But, those, what are those questions? Well, I don't know. Let's say you want to be a golf player. They ask like, oh, what's your score? I don't know. What is in golf? You, you mean within, within three questions? What's your handicap, right? You. Yeah. Well, and you don't know how to answer. And you're, they know you're, you're not a good player. And also they'll test you, right? But if you just blend in, Don't exaggerate. Don't say you have things you don't have. Just be there and make sure they know you're one of them. When a, when a golf player that if you want to be a golf player says, oh, this kid, you know, he's, he's good. I, I, I was like him when I was a kid. I, with love, they'll help you. How, how good do you feel when you're helping somebody that deserves it instead of doing a favor? When you help somebody that you believe that he'll make it, you do it with so much love. Instead of just, oh, I'm just doing him a favor because I'm a good guy, you know? So that's the point of being successful, blending in, in whatever you want to be. You want to be rich, then go to their events, do what they do, dress like they dress, 
and you'll get contacts, you'll get network, you you'll you'll do stuff if you're not faking it. And of course, if if you blend in, what if you are faking it? Well, if you're faking it, you you won't get too far. You're faking it with the people that didn't make no, it. But what 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 should they do if they're faking it? They already know they're faking it. Well, just go back and don't fake it. What do you mean, like? That's right. Do the work. Yeah. Like if you if you if you realize you're a fraud because there's people out there. You're that are, too occupied and spending so much money being a fraud. Just be there. You don't have to have this fake watch there. All you got to do is just go do the work. Yeah. To to not be the fake. Correct. And now you're real. Then proceed. Every successful guy was before a non-successful guy. That's right. So it, there's nothing wrong with being not successful yet. So you just have to show you're one of them just starting, that's, you know? That's, that's right. And then and, and then they'll for sure help you. So you live in Miami right now. I live in Miami now. Now, when you came over here, where'd you move to first? So I came to Brooklyn. That's where I started. I knew an Israeli guy that was in my unit that he was apparently making a lot of money. And, and what was I thought, he doing? well, he was buying, he was kind of doing wholesale real estate. He was going to court checking all the people that died the last six months, doing call calls. Hey, I know you're gonna hear this property. I'm sorry about your loss. I live in the area. And he was getting really good deals from that. It's just going to court. So when I first came, I found a Jewish guy that he let me stay in his abandoned house. He, he was for sale. So, you know, in Brooklyn, there's some areas you have squatters. Mm -hmm. So um, he said, just sleep here so that I don't get squatters and I'll let you sleep there for free. So I have $500. I said, okay. I have good ideas, I have knowledge, I have big balls, I'm gonna succeed. $20 a week for 25 weeks. If I don't make money, I'll kill myself. 25 weeks. Like not literally. Well, maybe I said it, but like you have 25 weeks to make money. That's a lot of time. Well, you're, that's only giving you $20 a week. You're right. That's a little budget. But that's the budget to eat, not to have my ideas work. Yeah, so what'd you do? So I, well, that's the thing. I have to reduce the budget because the air mattress cost me $60. So now I have less weeks to actually succeed. That's correct. But what I did, I, I got into this abandoned house and I start, I start working like old school wholesale real estate, knock on doors, stuff like that. I didn't know shit. I barely spoke English when I came. But these guys, oh, no worry. Everybody starts from here. Everybody starts from there. So, you know, yeah, sure. Let's do it. How many times have you heard, don't worry? Oops, many. <laughs> when I, now I learned. Every time they tell me, don't worry, I worry. That's, that's what I do now. So that's how I started. He, he doesn't have like a technology model of wholesale real estate. He does old school and he does really well. Because, uh, you know, a brownstone in Brooklyn, you can flip it for, you know, a really profitable. Even if you went yourself to court, you do two or three flips a year, you're doing really good money. But this, it's an old school model. I was knocking on doors. You know, I, I was calling people every day. Um, and it was really hard sleeping in an abandoned house to do that. Um, and then after two weeks of being like that, my mom calls me and... You know, when I finished the army, she was like, okay, hopefully now you can come visit me. You know, she lasted for, until I was serving the army, you know, she, she was, she was uh, fighting it. And I said, no, mom, I have this dream. I'm going to be rich. I'm going to go to America and be rich. I said, oh, okay, no problem. Let's just keep in touch. And then she calls me Monday. After two weeks, I arrived in New York. He call, she calls me Monday. And I said, mom, I'm taking a shit. I cannot answer you now. I'll call you back. Cause you're busy, you know, you're, you're just, oh, I have so many fo phone calls to do. And I have these, these houses, I can close it. I'll make money. You, you get blind and you don't realize your, your, your friends will die soon, you know, or not soon, but like you just don't realize you're so focused. And then two days after, which I forgot to call my mom, then my dad calls me and tells me, my dad never calls me. Like I was in the army for three years and he never called me, but he's okay. He loves me. I, I, he's just the dad that old school doesn't show low, too much love. I have to, Hey dad, how are you doing? But that's okay. But he called me. That's weird. So I answer and he tells me, you, you, are you sitting down? Yeah. Your mom died. And he, she literally called me two days before and she wanted to tell me something, you know, and. You didn't I, give her the chance. I, yeah. So until today I asked that. What you wanted to tell me? What did and he say? What did he say? What I say? No, what did she have to say? I don't, yeah, like, 
She literally called me before she died. Nobody knew but her? Well, I think she knew. Because the way she died, like, she had, like, a small... Sur- you know when you do dialysis, they have to change you. Like, they have you, like, a valve here, you know, like, to put blood here. And she told my dad, like, oh, hold my hand and don't you dare, like, leave it. And then, like, she died. So I think she knew. But I don't know. I will never know. So that's the thing. I was so focused in working that I took this. I barely cried my mom. Cried a little bit in the shower. And I had no money to go to the funeral. I was in Brooklyn living in an abandoned house. So I said, okay, I'm going to take this as a mission. I'm, I had money to take a lift to the airport. I'm going to go to the airport right now. And I'm going to start figuring out. But I have to be there. So I go to the airport with no money. I said, worst case scenario, I ask 600 people to give me $1 explaining I have to go to my mom's funeral. They'll help me. I, I know that. I'll be okay. Let's just go. So I go. I start doing some phone calls. And then there is this guy. He's Canadian. Uh, really wealthy family. And, and when I was in Israel and I graduated from the unit, he flew my mom and he flew my dad. Paid for my mom dialysis just for them to be in, in the graduation. And... Um, I don't really know if I call him or, or or he heard from other, you know, people that I was calling and he helped me. He bought a ticket back and forth to go to my mom's funeral. That's freaking awesome. Yeah. So when I, I barely cried my mom, I was, I, I've seen people I never seen in years. So I was this tough guy gone from the army. Don't cry, you know, don't show. And I was so focused on my mission that I, I came back a week after and no, they didn't take my time to cry enough or, or take care of mentally. And I focused just work, work, let's do it. Let's finish, let's do it. Now the problem is that after a few months, I, I wasn't getting no deals and I was running out of money. And um, I was already sleeping in my car, taking showers in Planet Fitness. I'm, I'm sorry to say the company name, but I think it's okay. And, yeah, go ahead. Okay, and I took a, I took showers there because it's ten dollars a month membership. Maybe they increased now, but it was ten dollars. So I was taking showers in the morning, put my dirty clothes in the um, luggage, and then Sundays for fifty cents just go to the laundromat. Phone calls, phone calls. Now once a month there is an organization named Friends of the IDF. I don't know if you heard about it. Amazing organization. They raise money for soldiers that need special things because they don't have families or. They have really hard things in their home while they're in the army. So they raise money for that. And they helped me. And my story of being in a special unit, coming from nothing, have no Hebrew, was a good one to, to, to help raise funds. So voluntarily, they flew me once a year, once a month, to speak and share my story with my uniform for, you know, galas. And in these galas, there is donors. There is people that give a lot of money. There is people, you know, powerful. They have influence. And I even spoke in Martha's Vineyard with the Israeli UN consul and the Israeli uh, US consul together. And then I flew back to sleep in my car. You know, nobody knew. Never show your weakness. That was something I, I never be this guy that they're doing you a favor. Just make sure you have value to give when you ask something. So when I spoke in Miami, I was living in New York. When I spoke in Miami, I get a host family to host me for the weekend. Uh, now, this guy, he's uh, Sam Moshe. Sam, he's a wealth manager in Morgan Stanley. He was on number nine by Forbes in Florida. And, man, he's... I'm sorry, when I speak about him, uh, it's really hard for me because I love him so much. We start speaking. He was in the Duve Devan unit in um, year 87. His parents were in France when he was in the army, so he was a lone soldier, let's call it like that. I was a lone soldier. My father was in, my parents were in Argentina. And same story. Then he came to America. He was selling t-shirts in New Jersey for $5 an hour. And now he's number nine by fourth wealth manager in Florida. So I wasn't there yet. I wasn't going to fake. I'm, I'm rich. I was just starting, but I showed my values. We have the same story. We have connection. And he, he realized I was, you know, one of his, you know, when I flew back to, um, New York, he starts calling me every morning, 5.30, 6 a.m., 4.30, FaceTime. You know, he wakes up really early to see the market, and then yeah, it, he starts trading, I believe, or I don't know what's the a web manager routine, but he starts extremely early, and he just check on me, you know, see if you're working hard, FaceTiming you 5.30. And after three, four days, I'm answering in my car, 
with all my clothes on because I didn't have money to uh, sleep with the car on because it's a lot of gas. So I had to sleep with just a lot of coats on me, you know? And after three days, he's like, are you sleeping in your car? Do that never showed my weakness for two years, like a year. And now like I, I got between, we say in Spanish, between the sword and the wall. Like, are you sleeping on your car? Yes, I am. And he's like, no, 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 dude, like you cannot do that. I understand what you're doing. I understand the hassle, but there's no point of, you're not in the army anymore. You don't have to be in these conditions. So he got me a ticket and he said, you can sleep in my couch. Do what you do, go to court, get, you know, good deals. If you have a cheap property, um, you know, uh, I don't, I'm not going to give you a commission. We're going to do it together. You know, you, you fix it and then we're going to sell it. We'll split the profits. Now that, that was an opportunity. So I said, okay, sure. I'll fly. I flew the same day. I arrived to his couch and start doing, you know, go to court. I'm taking him in the, in the morning to his office, then go to court. Then I'll pick him up, go and see what I show him what I did. The problem is that after two weeks, I was calling so many people, going to court. I was working so hard. I didn't have time to make money. And then I, in the shower, so nobody will listen to me. I'm literally banging my head in the wall. Like, what the fuck are you doing? There is a person that trusts you so much. You're sleeping in his couch and you're not giving him one deal. One deal, just one deal. And then I realized it's not my money. We're splitting it, but... I have to behave like I am the money. Who has the money and goes to court and literally cold calls like so much? Of course, you can do it if you want to show hustle to your workers, but who who will do that? Depend on that for your income when you have them. You are the money. So then I put in Google, I need to sell my house fast. And then all of these, you know, ex extremely good wholesale real estate were like, I buy your house cash, I, I buy your house all cash. In 10 minutes, I'll buy your house tomorrow. You know, all these people. And they're professional. And I said, okay, there is people that are doing it extremely more professional. Like, what's going on? Now, I don't have the time. I don't have money to hire people. But I'm going to just call them and say, hey, uh, I'm, not, I'm not selling my house, but do you have an investor list? Oh, yeah, for sure. What's your email? Okay, that's the thing. It worked. And now I have all these wholesalers giving me these deals. And I go to Sam at the end of the day and say like, hey, we have this deal, we have this deal. I did the comps, it's different now. So after, I think two weeks more, we found the first house in Delray Beach, uh, 40 minutes from uh, Miami. And uh, that was the first, the check I did. It took me three months to fix it. I didn't have money, but I was eating, it was on the budget, my lunch, it was on the budget of, of, you know, of the project. Now on weekends, what's a different story? My friend Ariel once gave me hundred dollars to eat, but I knew the house is going to sell. I'm going to get, get some bread. So then we did that. We did another house then. And then I said, okay, this is good. Real estate has a lot of potential, but I need to be rich now. That was my goal. I need money fast. I have to do something that will keep me faster. Like I can work on it and I'll get paid weekly, daily or something faster. And that's when I rediscover Amazon. Okay. I said, um, I have, um, I met this guy who sold a boat to one of my friends, Ibo Caraton, and he was showing me, he's selling online. He brings stuff from China. He drop ships also from Walmart. He does a lot of stuff on Amazon and he's, he gets paid every two weeks. So literally if you bring a product from China for $2 and you sold it for $20 here in Amazon, after two weeks, you'll get paid. So that said, okay, this is serious. I have contacts now, I have a network, people that trust me know my hustle, let's do this. So that's how I started. I started doing uh, Amazon stores. It worked really good for quite a few months. And then I met these two Jewish guys from Sunny Isles. They bring me to the office. I met them through a rabbi. And um, they should like, show me what you have. They, uh, we have an e-commerce company. And they tell me like, Okay, we like this. How do you feel about opening 160 stores? And I was like, um, yeah, I can do that. I didn't know how to scale it that quick, but you know, and when they saw I, I didn't have that experience, let's say like, oh, let's just do it in-house. You just come to, come with us. We'll get you a spot in the office. They have an extremely nice office, you know? And they give me an office next to them. I, I'm, I'm in the big leagues now. I was like, I made it. Bought my Porsche 911, killing it. 
24 years old, like I'm the best, you know, I did it so quick. And then what these people did is that we started, do they have no experience in business? Yeah, I came from nothing, sleeping in an abandoned house a year and a half ago. I trust these people, my religion, you know, I said, okay, they're, they're good businessmen, they have experience. They gave me a chance, they put me in an office. I start sharing know-how. You know, and then like, oh, but we cannot depend on you. We have to scale. Why don't you teach these employees like to show what you do so you can scale, just manage it. After like three months, they have all my know-how. I have no contract. They don't need me. So then uh, an Argentinian friend tells me like, dude, that's screwing you. Like you should be already getting paid all this money that the companies are making. Like, I don't think you're doing this right. Like, why don't you check with a lawyer or something, you know? So then I come to them, I was like, hey, let's sign an operating agreement. Dude, you already, they already have your know-how, you, they already know everything, they don't need you, you know, like, how you come to negotiate like that to the, to the table, right? I knew it was too late, but I had to do the last try, you know? And they, they gave me an operating agreement, there are two guys, but instead of doing three parties, they do, they're 66%, I'm 33 you know, that move, right? And then they can do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, I cannot do, a, B, C, D, F, G. So if I had so many limitations and you have so many rights, at least give me a non-compete. And they were like, oh, dude, like, oh, you know, we were doing e-commerce before, like, bullshit. I saved their business. They started making so much money because I started, you know, sharing my know-how. And that was Friday. You know, Jewish people, like, it's Shabbat, you know, like Friday night until Saturday night, they don't work. So I, I said, well, that's non-negotiable. Look, I'm speaking like a business now. Now, you know, I, I started to be a shark, I thought, right? I thought like, oh, look at me. I'm saying non-negotiable to like two old 60 year old people. Like I'm the killer. I thought I was. And then, you know, Friday we don't speak, Sunday don't work. Monday I go to the office, my, my kid doesn't work. <laughs> they have everything, all my money, all my know-how. And now I have bills to pay because I thought I made it and I'm rich now. And so now I have to pay my car, I have to pay my rent. What the fuck am I doing? So I call them and I'm like, oh, my kid doesn't work. Did something happen? And they're like, well, you said it's non-negotiable. So just tell us what your address will email you your stuff. What? That was the, the first reality slap, you know, like it was, it was really bad. I was kind of on the streets now, right? Well, he's booted you. Like, yeah. I mean, it, look, looking now into like, I took it personally, of course, because I just started why looking the perspective. Why didn't you pull out some Israeli special forces on there? Well, I did to, I did it to open the door <laughs> and get myself, <laughs> at least, you know, but I knew I, you can do anything, you know, they'll, you know, what so I'm going to do. So they ended up screwing you over. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, and now you're out on your ass again, once again. Again. I thought I was a killer and I was not. Well, I was, but it's just one obstacle. What the, were you teaching them that they didn't already know? Well, they were doing they were doing Google ads to sell to dropship products from um WordPress websites. And I mean look, if you have a formula that works good, but they were like over months and months going with people. They even had one guy from South America that say like I have 160 employees. They were paying like 160 employees salaries. Well, it's South America, it's much less than here. And then they discover that the guy was just one guy with 160 people that just gave their IDs to say they work for him and he was just cashing out. So when they saw me and they saw I'm, I have good faith, they're like, okay, come here, you know? Now the problem is like, how do I start? Now I start making phone calls again. I have a know-how, I just have to make it work. This was already before before the uh, coronavirus, already like December 2019. And um, I had also many stores that I had access online. So then I start scaling again with other people. I have some investors that got screwed by them, that they came to me straight because I had no contract, you know, I have no compete, right? They said it's non negotiable. I said that, but so now I have clients, I have people that trust me. So I start scaling again, new partnerships, new people. And in coronavirus, I had so many online stores. I did in revenue 4.2 million in, in 2020, just by that. Nice. And that's, that's how I got rich, let's say. Now the problem is 
This is what I speak in the second book, the art of protecting ourselves. Why is it an art? My three phases work extremely good. Why? As I, let's just repeat them really quick. I did a point of no way back when I came to America. I blend in with the people that were uh, donating money. They show my potential, show my values. They helped me. And they also got, you know, something back. It's not like, you know, Sam, of course he did because he liked me, but he also got money from the, from the house we flipped. You know, it's not like for free, no favors. And then the third one, which is variables. I, you know, I didn't, I didn't expect that variable of them changing the lock, but everything worked. So then the problem is the three phases work to get it to the top, but now I'm in the top and I'm empty. What do I do now? Okay. I did money. So then I was really deep into two problems, which I didn't know it was. I just felt empty. And I tried everything. I tried meditation. I tried weed, CBD, yoga, Pilates, you call it, you name it. I tried everything and I was still feeling empty. The sun, you know, you made money, but now the, the sun goes up to everybody the same. Like, what? what's your next goal? Like, more money? It just never ends. You need to find something. And I just couldn't find it. And I was so deep in the press, borderline suicide. And my two mistakes were this. I don't know if you heard about the Jordan Peterson theory about agreeable and disagreeable, but the problem is that I didn't realize I was, I became extremely agreeable. What is an agreeable person? An agreeable person is most of the people, um, which they want to have peace. They want a good ambient. So maybe if the boss asks like, Hey, can you stay two hours more? Knowing they don't want to stay, knowing they need to pick up their kids. So, you know, it's my boss. I want to be nice. I want to show I'm a good guy. So I'm going to help him. But then the next day, they're going to ask you to stay earlier. Then the next day, they're going to ask you to pick up from the airport at 3 a.m. And you just the good guy. The good guy doesn't really go too much far. If he, if, if he gets far, then it won't last too much because everybody's going to eat them alive. Because now you have people, you're agreeable and you have money, you're done. I was paying my, my, my friend's medic bills and I didn't fix my teeth. Look how looking for validation I was. And then at these agreeable people, their purpose is first. Their mission is first. It's non-negotiable. Like, you just met me. Would you pick me up in the airport at 3 a.m.? No. But I was falling into that, into that validation that I wanted to look into people because I was so empty. And that gave me like, oh, I have a purpose. I'm going to help people now. But hold on, help yourself. No, I was just so blind. That was my first mistake. And then my second one is... You know this theory? I'm sure you heard about alpha male, alpha woman, beta, beta, and gamma, and gamma. Like the alpha male is, the, let's say we're in a jungle, the guy that goes hunt and brings meat for the society, and then there's people that just stay there but organize, and there's just the gamma, they eat last, they don't like themselves, they always last. Now, I thought I was an alpha male because my purpose was first. That's what I thought. I was just feeling so em a little bit empty, right? That's what I thought. The problem is that I re didn't realize that there is a no between the gamma and the alpha, there is another place in the hierarchy, which is an alpha, a fake alpha. Now, what is a fake alpha? This is not about having money or faking the money. This is a guy that is so insecure about himself and he's so empty and he knows that he's not getting success for who he is. He doesn't trust the process. So he's just worried about what other people think. And this is what I call TFS, temporary feeling of superiority. When you're an alpha male and you walk in the room, you know you're superior. Like you feel like, I'm not saying like you feel better than others, but you know you got attention. You know you're the killer. People pay to, to fucking listen to you. But now when you don't have that, you can buy this temporary feeling of superiority with money or with social media. I'm going to go to the restaurant with my Lamborghini and I'm going to sit with 10 Russian models with big titties eating my $1,000 steak. Everybody's going to look at me. I'm the king. I have this temporary feeling of superiority. But when I go back to sleep, I know, I see all their Instagrams, they just, they, nobody tag me, right? Nobody, they're just there for, 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 that the attention for you know for the temporary thing of superiority but they're not there for who i am they don't want to share who i am they don't want to share me they're them 
This is fake. But you get so addicted to that feeling. And I'm talking about athletes, rappers, singers, actors, business people that made it fast as me. They feel, they fell really quick into this temporary feeling of superiority. Where they're just spending money, showing stuff like, dude, it's okay that you have money, but you don't have to look everybody's attention. Look at Bill Gates. Look at, you know, all these people that are extremely wealthy. They're not looking for validation. They know who they are. They know what they do. Everybody knows that. Now, the problem is that these people that are so insecure about themselves can cause other people going to depression. Why? A fake alpha is extremely, de- it's, 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 it's a harming to the society. It's a problem to have these people in the world. And I'll tell you why. Should we kill them all? No, but we should make sure we recognize them and stay away and not be like them. Because I didn't recognize them. I thought these people could be successful. I was so into my goals, I just felt empty. And now I'm, all of a sudden I'm deep into this fake alpha area of the society. Iced out watch, Gucci shoes, everything. You, I have to, you know, buy my new Lambo, get with 10 girls to the club, pop some bottles with big titties and fires, you know, like just show, 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 looking for validation. Now, a person that is working hard, just didn't make it yet, maybe sleeping in his car, he sees it in social media, and he wants to, like, what the fuck am I doing? Working hard for my dream? If I, I only had $2,000, I can have this feeling. How much costs to rent a Lambo? Okay. Um, and now they get addicted to this temporary feeling of super. This temporary feeling of superiority is extremely addictive. Extremely addictive. And there's no treatment for that just by realizing and get out of that. Like, what are you going to do? Weird, you're still going to, you know? There's really no way out. And I was so deep into that. So deep. And the problem about this is, you don't only harm other people that want to be successful with who they are and see this and, okay, I'm going to try that. And now they got this attention. Now they're so addicted to this temporary feeling. They'll stay, do, they'll stay there doing those stuff and they won't work hard for their dreams. How many people you know that they buy cars they cannot afford, they buy houses they cannot afford just to have this temporary feeling of superiority? Now, the problem is also in the woman, you know, you have, let's say, an alpha male, an alpha woman could be, a famous singer, a, f- a famous artist, a famous uh, businesswoman. You know, they're, let's say, a boss bitch. You know, like, this. oh, I want to be a bad bitch. I want to be the boss bitch. Oh, she's the, she's the best. She's the boss. And they're extremely successful at what they do. But then you have girls that are fake alpha women, right? They not only finance this good taste, these trips to Maldives, these yachts, by an insecure man, which is an alpha, a fake alpha. They also destroy all the girls that are working hard for their dream, and now they realize, wait, what? Like, instead of like working hard for my dream, I'll just get money from this guy who pays girls to go to dinner for, or I'm gonna open an OnlyFans and make $75,000 a month just by showing my titties. Which I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not underestimating that job, but I'm saying, why are you going the easy way? If you believe in yourself, you believe in who you are, why would you take just selling your image or what you can show to others? Why don't you, you will feel empty. You, you will be like showing so much that then you're not, you're not showing who you are. So you will feel empty. You'll fall into the big depression. So is this your book now? It's just so, so the second saving one, people from that? So the first one is the three phases towards, towards instant success, instant success that will help you to get there. But now the second one, which I'm finishing it, it's going to be published in June. It's about how to maintain yourself in the top without falling into depression, without falling into any kind of drugs. Give you some but purpose. Give you, understand what you have to do to make sure you feel good about yourself. Be proud and not give away nothing. Don't, don't be agreeable. Don't be this nice guy. Like, dude, help yourself first. And and I look, I'm telling you, I, it was really deep. I was having so many cars and ha- living my life, traveling all over, living in a big crib in Houston in that time. I was the guy that everybody wants to be at 24 years old. Let's call it like that. But I was so empty. And, and if you, t- you, I can tell you, like, you can see this in actors. You can see this in rappers. I thought watches going to the club, popping bottles, like paying for their friend bills. Does that mean, does that mean they're all empty? I'm, I believe they are. So if someone unless they understand it's part of the show and they just if they're like oh no I need to do this for 
this is my show, but they need to understand that and not believing, okay, this is giving me my temporary feeling of superiority. You have to separate that. Now, if I pop a bottle now, but I know there is uh, two important guys, I'm going to send them a bottle, let's say like a, it's network, you know, I'm working, but I'm not going to do it to get validation from others. You have just to make the difference. Right, but, you know, some people with money like nice shit. I understand. But make sure you buy nice shit for yourself, not to for what they say. It's but who, one, but one, who's, the, who's the judge? You said they, they all well, the rappers. Well, they are like the if judge. if the rappers show up with diamond watches that they must be empty, I don't know. Maybe they're just rich. Well, I'm sure there is people that are sure about themselves. Because like, like what if, what if to... Like, what if these glasses were $100,000 and if you're rich, it's like big deal. And they are quality. Usually the more expensive shit is, the better it is. Usually. Right. Not always. But like, I buy quality shit. You know what I mean? Right. It's not because I'm empty. No. It's because I like quality shit. Yeah, but what about spending on something that doesn't have the quality, but it looks like shiny? Well, again, I don't do that. Well, but there's people that do that. I'm, so you don't I, have to read I'm my books. I'm sure there is. Matter of fact, one time I was at a hockey game and this guy looked like I was, he was all blinged out and he did something with his hand and his ring flew off and it landed below my chair. So I reached down to pick it up, to hand it to him. And it was like tin. It was like this really almost tin feeling thing where, you know, you, you look at it and it looks like this big old blingy, weighty, diamond ring and it was really a diamond foil of some kind wow so again there's people out there doing that but i'm not talking about you know that i'm talking about like you know you said a blingy watch like that's not blingy no that's quality yeah it's badass correct but i didn't but i didn't buy it so y'all think i'm cool you buy I it for yourself it, i bought it because i think it's cool not only that look at how it goes with this deal <laughs> Like you got to match. That's true. And so, so I'm just, cause there's people out there like that too. So I'm just letting the listeners. No, it's okay to buy you nice stuff. You got, you, you got half these people. You need to enjoy your stuff. You need to enjoy your, your money. You need to make sure you got some bling there. You need to treat yourself. You need to do it. But just because you need it, you want it. You want to pamper yourself, prioritize yourself. Put when you yourself have, when first. When you have a billion dollars, what will you drive car wise? A billion dollars? I'll fly. You won't drive anywhere? <laughs> well, maybe I'll have a chauffeur. But you won't drive anything? Well, maybe I'll buy nice cars. What, I don't think so. But at that time, you know, mom, you have already fuck you money. You don't need you don't need that shit. Just get an Uber XL and No, but that's the point I'm making. Once you get the money, it's nice to have that shit. Correct. It is correct. But there is one difference having it just because you want it, and it makes you feel good. Yeah, but who doesn't want a Ferrari? Uh, there's people there. You but I'm not you against buying would you Ferraris. I, I will buy one of Ferrari. Hell yeah! I had a Lamborghini. I had I had stuff. Yeah, but people, but you said you were being. Uh, I was doing it because I wanted validation. Yeah, you wanted to be accepted. Yes. And by the way, that's a that's a effective way to do it. Like you know, there's people that flash the nice shit and they got accepted because of all that nice right. shit. But they got accepted by the people that just want that. But what about... I know, but sometimes they turn that into something real, meaning they you started, can make business out, started out, that. out by faking it. And guess what? Faking it until they made it worked. For a few people I know. I believe that faking until you make it will work with somebody that didn't make it yet. You're faking it to the guy that didn't make it yet and you can make money from them. Let's say you, you're flashing stuff on Instagram, which is all rented, but then you sell your course, How to Be Rich. And now people that didn't make it believe you made it because you're faking it really good and, now and they'll rich. buy your course, you but, know? But now you're rich. Well, now you're rich. So the people that were rich that think you were faking it realize you're not faking it because you made millions. Well, now. And now you own Pier 1 Imports. But there is a, kind, there is, there is a moral thing too. Would you be okay selling yeah, like a, a use, book? Use Ty Lopez as a perfect example. Yes. Yeah. Well, I heard also Robert Kiyosaki wasn't rich when he wrote the book. Um, I don't know about that, but I but, dad, I, know, but I know Ty and I know his story. He he was fairly successful before he pulled that, you know, house thing off. The whole Lambo in the garage thing. Mm -hmm. Like he did that purposely. He knew what he was doing. 
it's okay. It's your strategy. I know, I, but it worked. I respect it the worked, hustle. Because that dude got rich but there is in the a moral foot up thing a bull's too. ass. There is a moral thing too. Moral what? Will you be okay teaching how to be rich without you making it? Mm, I don't know. Well, again, just depends on which case you're talking about. Generally, I would recommend you don't scam people. Right. But if I said, I'm going to teach you how to get rich before I was rich and I got rich teaching you how to get rich, I would teach you how to teach people to get rich the way I did. <laughs> right. That's correct, too. You just got to keep stick to what you know. That's correct. When someone says, well, how do you know? Well, because I got rich selling people how to get rich seminars. See what I'm saying? So now I'm rich. I'm going to teach you how to get rich doing the same thing. Yeah. And there is people doing that. Yeah. Well, again, yeah. At the end of the day, man, you want to be rich. Number one, you got to sell something. Number two, you got to market. You got to learn marketing. The, the best marketers are the ones paid the most. Right. Because if you take a great salesperson over here and you drive 100 customers at them, you take an average salesperson over here and you drive a thousand customers at them. The average person is going to outproduce the good one. Right. So it's not the sales. It's not the closing techniques that that's as important as it is the traffic and traffic's marketing. You got to market. And sometimes when you market, you want to buy a flashy car or a fancy watch so you can get access to the right clubs, the right people, get the right eyeballs on you. You know what I mean? Get the followers. Money goes where attention is, right? Well, I'll tell you, the, the, you know, followers, people are like, you know, well, who, who cares about followers? Listen, if you got real followers, not fake ones, but real followers, dude, that's, that's power. Like I can say, you know, hey, I just came out with my glasses and boom, all of a sudden I can make a glass company successful. Right. And then, hey, I just started my own lawn, lawn, com lawn care company. And next thing you know, you know, everybody's like, hey, Brad, I need my lawns done. And, you know, next thing you know, you, you, you got multiple successful businesses. Why? From that following. Well, how'd you get the following? I bought a car I couldn't afford and I put it online. And so now everybody started following me for the wrong reason, but they still followed me. And now I am successful because I turned that following into revenue. That's legit. People can do that. I mean, I, I wouldn't recommend it as a strategy, but I know people that would and have. And there's people that it worked for them. Fuck yeah, it worked. It worked yeah. well for a lot of, for a lot for a of lot. people, actually. It does. An audience really gets you a lot. Yeah, but like you follow me on social media? I follow you. You see that I got a Ferrari? I saw that once or twice you don't see it in every post you don't see me sitting on it like this and shit correct Which, you're not like yeah yeah because now that Ferrari. i'm getting buff i might go do a pose with it no just joking but here's the difference which i said in social media one thing is to show what you have another thing is to show not only what you have what made you actually get that yeah what you have in you that can impact lives and teach others or move others to have what you have. Yeah, that's why I like you, dude, because you're passionate about that. Yes. You're, you're out there writing books, and you make it seem so easy. So the, the three phases, number one, burn your boats. Go all in, basically. Yes. Okay, number no two. No way back. Number two. Number two, blend in. Blend sure, in. Yes, not fake it until you make it. Be there until you make it. Yeah, Become. 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 You got to yes. become. Eat what they eat. Sleep how they sleep. That's everything. right. You got to be before you can become right correct so then step three is variables oh yeah variables get prepared prepare exactly prepare for every possible outcome correct you learn that in the israeli armed forces yes because if you don't learn that you're in shock there is something popular it's called lm krav in hebrew combat shock i don't know if that's the correct translation which means you go arrest this guy and he's not in the house and now daughter is crying uh, uh, what, what are you doing you're, you're sweating and you don't know what you do and you're in shock you can get a panic attack from that and they can even have to take you out of the stretcher from that but if you have all the variables learned okay this issue okay this issue, okay no problem you're a robot there's no way how much shock. time should one spend preparing well it depends on the mission it depends on what's your what's your goal so this book but will teach mission. me how to do it all well, there are some missions that will take months of preparations. The only reason why we, there's missions that take years of preparations. Should one try a mission without being prepared? Uh, well, yeah, but that's on luck. You will be depending on your luck, not on what your strategy. So the book that you just released, 
Yes. The three phases, phases towards uh, instant success. Towards instant success. It's on Amazon. Correct. People can go buy right now. Yeah, right now. And it's going to teach them how to deploy these three things. They're going to goes into a lot more it, depth. It it teaches you what the what Israeli special forces are using to have multiple daily secret missions to help you to do that yourself in in your goal, whatever it is your goal. Now, if you guys want to follow this dude, it's Morito. It's Maurito. I-T-S-M-A-U-R-I-T-O on That's social correct. media. You can find him at Mauro Stendel, M-A-U-R-O-S-T-E-N-D-E-L dot com. Go get his books. He's got a second book coming out. Yes, in June. You, what do you do on your social media? You drop a knowledge or... Well, Until now, I did everything in Spanish because that's, you know, um, good friends of mine who are marketers, really good ones. They're also into NFTs. They taught me, like, speak to your people first. Make sure you speak to your people. That's how you're going to get a big audience first. And it worked. In like six months when I started speaking, I have like 140 something thousand followers. So now I want to expand. I want more. I have ambition. So I'm speaking in English because I'm living in America. You're blending in. I'm blending in. Folks, you heard him. As always, till next time, keep it real. Dropping bombs with the real Bradley. Subscribe now. That's good.